The American dream. What does that phrase even mean? Because it's wildly open to interpretation. But I think to a lot of Americans, it's being given the chance to do your work with dignity. So for the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to examine the old American work ethic and try to understand how far too often labor seems to get in the way of work. If you don't know the difference between labor and work, it's like the difference between sleeping and dreaming. In other words, the American dream is littered with a lot of lumpy mattresses. Did you like that metaphor? I did. There's gonna be plenty more, so stick around. The notion of the American dream has been embedded in America's creation myth since the day the first pilgrims planted their buckled boots on Plymouth Rock, which actually never happened because Plymouth Rock is the size of a small garden feature. But the hard work ethic and the very definition of success itself has mutated over the years, from something spiritual to something material to something that nowadays seems almost undefinable. Still, it's the cement that unifies Americans. From industrialists to politicians to artists to writers to the everyday working stiff, the message is the same. Put in a little elbow grease and your efforts will be rewarded. But it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes the dream turns into a nightmare. All you gotta tell me now is wow, 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 wow. Welcome to the working week. Oh, I know it don't thrill you. I hope it don't kill you. Welcome to the working week. Oh, I welcome to the working week. America was founded on the idea of redemption, second chance, a fresh start if you're willing to put your back to the plow. No country has condensed its creation myth more than America. If you were a slave or an indentured servant, lazy, alcoholic, landless, impoverished, riddled with typhoid, or accidentally tomahawked by a Mohican, guess what? You're not making it into America's history books. Americans celebrate exceptionalism and progress. It's a reason that we call ourselves the land of opportunity and not a land of opportunity because apparently most Americans have never heard of New Zealand. But here's the thing, for every industrial achievement, for every rags to riches story, for every great invention, from, a, from this, this incredibly pliant but durable jacket to this smartphone, somewhere scores of people are hunched over workbenches trying desperately not to stitch or solder their fingers together. If hard work is so ethical, how come there's seldom anything ethical about making people work hard? When Americans talk about a work ethic, what they mean is hard effort is its own virtue. It's a doctrine that came across on the Mayflower, the day the Puritans set sail for Plymouth Rock. The Mayflower sailed into Cape Cod, Massachusetts in November of 1620, after a 66-day voyage. Now, it's generally noted that about half the people on the boat were separatists, Calvinists, but here's a more specific breakdown. 33 of those people were elderly and pretty much wished they died on the boat before they ever arrived. Another 57 realized immediately what a horrible, horrible mistake they'd made leaving Europe. The remaining 42 set about making the lives of the other 90 excruciatingly miserable. It was kind of like Butlins, but worse. The first couple years were really hard. Um, they came over, and the first year they planted their crops, and enough of them came up that they could survive another year. But the following year, they the didn't do so well, and it looked like the crops would fail, and that would have been the end of the colony. So the Puritans who settled the colonies in North America were predisposed to misery. They believed they were the people that the Book of Revelations had chosen to go into the wilderness because some shit was about to go down. So they were willing to flagellate themselves with toil because that is an inherent Calvinist principle. Okay, in essence, Calvinism goes like this. God has predetermined who's making the team, and it's the hardest workers. But just because you're on the team doesn't mean you're in the starting lineup. But if you don't act like you're in the starting lineup, you're not even going to make the team. Man's character, fate, and morality are determined by his labors.
If you were educated or aristocratic, you were called master or mistress. If you were a craftsman, like a wheelwright or a glass blower, you were a goodman. Beneath the goodmen were the indentured servants. Beneath the indentured servants were the kids who were exploited beyond belief, put out to labor from sunup till sundown. So a typical day in a Puritan kid's life would probably consist of uh, awakening before dawn, sitting down to a hot steaming bowl of grubs and larva. Then they would be sent out into a field where they might be strapped to a large immovable boulder in the hopes that a sudden growth spurt would dislodge the thing. Afterwards, four or five hours in a dank schoolhouse where the only books were a Bible and a trilogy called Thousands and Thousands of Mohicans, Not So Many Mohicans, Last of the Mohicans, and afterwards, chores, such as sewing by candlelight until you went blind, or assisting mom through yet another stillbirth. Good times. Everyone knew their place, and everything was achieved for the greater glory of God. If you think about it, there's no more effective incentive to work than the notion that when a flashing white-hot streak of lightning fills the sky, and the blindingly bright figure of Christ descends to earth to pluck his chosen ones, you don't really want to be caught goofing off at the water cooler. The belief in personal salvation through work is how the Plymouth Colony survived. Work, 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 work. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. They proved that you could tame the American wilderness, but the flood of people who followed, the Amish, the Quakers, the Lutherans, the Protestants, the Catholics, they didn't adhere to that same ascetic, probably because they looked at these right-wing religious zealots and thought to themselves, hey, wait a minute, if, if hard work is the core of spirituality, how come the most spiritual people of all, monks, don't work at all. Mm, major paradigm shift. Religious freedom gave way to personal motivation. By the middle of the 18th century in America, a good deal of secularization had taken place. The idea that one worked for the glory of God was slowly replaced with the byword usefulness. America was still a spindly leg puppy, and the only way it was gonna survive was if every man, woman, and child expended some dogged persistence. Benjamin Franklin, more than anyone else, condensed this idea into the kind of aphorisms that stuck easily into people's heads. He invented the bumper sticker before there were bumpers. Franklin was America's first exemplary model of the self-made man. He was born poor in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1706. At the age of 10, taught himself to read Latin, but dropped out of school. He invented swim fins for the hands, so you knew this guy was going places. Then he became a printer's apprentice, and at the age of 24 started publishing under a pseudonym, Poor Richard's Almanac a compendium of uh, idioms and weather forecasts and predictions written in a vernacular that regular people could relate to. A penny saved is a penny earned. Fish and visitors stink after three days. I believe that once all the hoopla has died down that the Dave Clark Five will be bigger than the Beatles. 1730, he was elected official printer for Pennsylvania cranking out state currency. The man was literally given a license to print money. He would go on to invent the Franklin stove, bifocals, American independence, and something else that I can't quite think of right now. It'll come to me. He was an abolitionist and a vegetarian. It would have been useful if Franklin had invented the wristwatch because his exhortations about time equating money would have been lost on most 18th century New Englanders. They didn't know what time it was. They knew when the sun came up, when the sun went down. They knew when it was planting season, harvest season, fallow season. It was a self-employed nation, industrious, but not yet industrial. And it was a very simple economic tenet. A man's efforts are his to exert, 
and the successes are his to be reaped. For a short period, this pure fiduciary equation worked. But then that pesky old southern bugaboo, Cotton, raised its head. Cotton. It's hard to believe that a huge chunk of America's problems, racial tensions, the Mason-Dixon line, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow laws, the KKK, civil rights, some bigoted 20-year-old kid running a Dodge Challenger into a group of protesters, every dumbass, redneck, cracker barrel shred of racism that exists in America is the indirect result of a fabric. A fabric. God, if only Northerners had been happy wearing wool or hemp or muskrat pelts, America would be a different nation. A nation itching and scratching its sweaty ass off, but a less racist nation. In our historically redacted world, we like to think that the North was anti-slavery and thus morally superior to the South, but that's not remotely the case. Southern slavery and King Cotton were inextricably intertwined with the North. The founding of the Merrimack Mills in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1822 changed the industrial order in America. It was the first mega factory. All that cotton picked by bonded slaves from the South came here, where it was loomed by wage slaves, or as we like to call them, women. The way the mills first got their employees was Francis Cabot Lowell, the founder of the Lowell manufacturing industry. He went out to farm communities throughout New England himself, and he would talk to groups of farmers and say, send us your daughters. We are going to take care of them. We are going to keep them on the morally straight and narrow. We are going to make sure they're educated. We're going to pay them well. Send us your daughters, and they will be working in our companies, making American products, and you can be proud of them. Ranging in age from seven to 35, the mill girls, or mules as they came to be known, worked an average of 73 hours a week. They slept six to a room in dormitories. And after work, they were encouraged by the mill's matrons to read and write and paint, you know, to improve their standing in society. They even had their own publication, the Lowell Offering, full of poems and short stories celebrating the enlightened culture of being strapped to a card spinner for 14 hours a day. When the girls first came here, it was really seen as this revolutionary new way of running America, you know, this new industry, this new opportunity. I'm not sure if they were looked up to, but they were applauded. They were applauded for taking the chance and going to work for themselves. Almost immediately, a kind of proto-feminist argument arose. Were these mill girls being exploited or were they emancipated because they had paying jobs as opposed to staying on the farm and earning zilch? Sure, it was lousy wages. They were medically misunderstood. They were a non-entity at the ballot box, but they were making money. No. It was shit! God! Imagine listening to this for 16 hours a day. This is worse than a Kasabian album. The more highfalutin members of New England society took the term mill girl and turned it into a class slur. Shame, shame on you. There were rumors started about loose morality, um, that they were going out and doing things that girls of, of New England shouldn't be doing. So the reputation started to change. As decades went on and more and more mills were built, wages went down, and it was the immigrant women who started to work in the mills. Then it was seen really as dirty work that only dirty people would do. Because these women weren't home scrubbing and baking and wringing and washing, they weren't fit for breeding or marriage. And that's where we get the term spinster. Shame on you. So, off the backs of slaves and through the gnarled fingers of young women, America entered its industrial age. They offered me the office of a
the self-employed enterprises gave way to factories. People engaged in mind-numbing, specialized tasks, making things for the nation to use when the nation wasn't working, which was practically never. The work ethic had become a maze of paradoxes. On the one hand, it impelled the restless energy of a young nation. America had become a powerhouse, and there was a sense of mission. But these same workers were trapped in a cycle of monotony, forced discipline, where was the individual creativity? Where was that sense of usefulness that Franklin liked to talk about? By the mid-1800s, the northern United States was one giant steaming workhouse, consumed by the idea that a man's physical output determined his destiny. So there was no excuse not to bust your butt. Now maybe you're thinking, geez, Rich, didn't people ever lighten up back then? They couldn't have spent all their time working. Well, of course there was leisure time. There was baseball and Cracker Jacks. A day at the track, parades, capades, and county fairs where the gals dressed in gingham. If you had a little cash, you could take in the follies. Now, if you were a kid, you might spend a lot of leisure time sitting down with your McGuffey Reader, the most popular school book of the time, full of wisdom and lifestyle tips. Lucy has a new box, a big box. Let us go and see it. Lucy's box is red. It is a hot day. Let us go out. Let us go out with our dog to the new cut hay. Let us put hay on our dog. It will be fun. Let us go. And in the evening, the family would sit around and play a wildly popular board game called the checkered game of life. The game of life. It was invented in 1860 by a man named Milton Bradley and quickly became the favorite parlor pastime in America. The object of the game was to reach successful old age, which at the time was about 45. Along the way, trying to avoid such misfortunes as disgrace, poverty, crime, prison, the fat office, and suicide. Fun for the whole family. The game is still popular today, but it's been updated a bit. Uh, for instance, you now achieve success by graduating college, getting a job, finding a spouse, finding a home, buying a car. The suicide option has been replaced by bankruptcy, but you can work your way out of total financial devastation by merely helping the homeless or recycling, just like real life. The whole notion of the American dream, the land of opportunity, is predicated on cultivation. Anyone who's ever seen some fossilized septuagenarian pottering around their sad allotment can see how elated they are when they coax a few runner beans into existence. Why? Because dirt makes people happy. The notion of owning the proverbial 40 acres and a mule was irresistible to a lot of Americans. In 1860, true freedom for a lot of Americans Lay out west. The famous John Gast painting, American Progress, sums it up pretty succinctly. Old America was a greasy mechanic trapped in a mind-numbing production line with some fat, rich boss breathing down its neck. New America, an ethereal female spirit stringing telegraph wire like the Wichita lineman. If the Wichita lineman was wearing a diaphanous negligee, shepherding steam engines and wagon trains across the Great Plains toward untold riches, while terrorized buffalo and Indians scamper off into the margins. Who wouldn't want a piece of that? As America expanded, more and more Europeans followed, trailing in the celestial prop wash of that floating female godhead of fortune. I told you there'd be more metaphors. One group in particular made the most of their newfound opportunity. Germans. Dark as shame, darling, dark as shame. 46 million Americans have some kind of German ancestry, and that makes them the largest ethnic majority in America. How did this happen? Well, in 1848, a wave of rebellions broke out against the autocratic princes and barons who ruled Germany. 
which at the time was a loose collection of near-feudal states. After the revolt, some of these rabble-rousers and organizers hot-footed it for America. Fortunately, their arrival coincided with the signing of the Homestead Act, which had opened up the Midwest to settlers. So these God-centric German folk moved west, settling along the Mississippi River in places like Iowa or Illinois. And they brought with them a more precise work ethic and some pretty nifty inventive ideas. A lot of these early German colonies were uh, very hardcore religious. Moravians, Waldensians, Amish, Hutterites, you know, old school. But even the most pious German can't seem to help himself when it comes to work. By God, they've got to invent something. That's why here at the Amana Colonies, a religious commune, which up until 1939 operated off of a mill race, invented the microwave. The Amana radar range is the first home use microwave technology ever invented. And you're looking at the very first model ever made in the whole world. So this actually wasn't called a microwave. This is called a radar range. It's a radar range, yes. They trademarked the technology and everything, and eventually, of course, that technology was, was taken to other places. And so they obviously couldn't call it a radar range, otherwise that was copyright infringements. And so they people called it a microwave, and that's what it's been called ever since. Right. But it's really a radar range. Correct. There's radar in there. Yeah. In the 1960s, Amana Appliances had become a household name, what every housewife and game show contestant dreamt of. So, while some Germans made a life for themselves in the Midwest, trying to revolutionize how we heat popcorn, a good number moved to big cities, trying to revolutionize the labor movement. The Germans who settled Chicago in the 1800s were a completely different culture than those pious, prune-faced Puritans who settled Massachusetts. Let me put it another way. Germans don't take a lot of shit. I said, come on. The atmosphere of labor relations in Chicago in the late 19th century was a tinderbox, to say the least. I said, come on. There were relentless strikes, raw knuckle demonstrations, flashpoint confrontations between workers and owners, often organized by outside agitators who wanted a radical change in how America worked. There's a term in the United States for the, the lethargy and the lack of productiveness that Americans feel at the beginning of the work week. It's called Blue Monday. The saying goes, never buy a car made on a Monday. Well, Germans have the same term, Blaumachen, but it describes the restlessness that Germans feel when they're sitting around on a Monday waiting for indigo dye to dry. Germans don't like not being productive. Do you understand? Chicago, in 1880, was full of Germans and Bohemians. Companies like Pullman and McCormick paid them $1.50 a day. They worked 60 hours a week, six days a week. And because Germans expect to be paid for their efforts, things weren't exactly gemutlichkeit. The Haymarket tragedy of 1886 is probably the singular most critical event in the history of American workers' rights. May 4th, 1886, when a uh, protest was held against police brutality in Chicago with the hope that 20,000 people would come. The background of all this, of course, is a fight for the eight-hour day, the right to organize, the right to free speech, all the things that were suppressed by uh, the owners of industry. The rally is called, it's disorganized, it's terrible weather, and only 2,000, 2,500 people show up. So they mounted these hay wagons to talk and used fiery rhetoric about this has to stop, this attack on workers, every, you know, trying to organize unions. Towards the end of the rally, most of the crowd had left. There's 250 people in the crowd. And the final speaker, Samuel Field, is uh, speaking. And um, the police inspector, Bonfield, marches his 176 police officers up to the crowd and says, I command you in the name of the people to disperse. 
And Samuel Fielden says, but this is a peaceable meeting. And at that very moment, what is observed is a five pound dynamite bomb that lands at the foot of uh, the police and kills a policeman. That explosion blew out the lights and the police were armed and they started shooting. The bomb blast killed seven policemen. In the ensuing violence, four workers were killed. Many more were injured. Next day, martial law is declared in Chicago, and within a short period of time, this great, incredible, unfair trial takes place. And um, eight men are convicted of conspiracy to commit violence and murder, uh, six of them German-born, uh, uh, one American-born and one from England. Americans were being told that long-haired, creepy, socialist German uh, agitators, bomb throwers, are trying to ruin our way of life. That was the rhetoric in the newspapers. It's about the basic fundamental democratic and what is so much an American ideal, the right to freely assemble, uh, the right to organize, and the suppression of that is really what the Haymarket story is about. One of the great anomalies of the U.S. is that unlike the U.K. or Australia, it's never had a labor party. You know, a political party made up of and representing workers. Why? Because the first labor movements in America managed to let anarchists slip into their ranks. Ever since, labor movements have been infected with that dreaded word, socialism, which in America is a word that easily morphs into the next word, communism. Every the Haymarket tragedy in Chicago reverberated throughout the world, and Chi-Town was now being perceived as a hotbed of pink-tinged radicalism, social decay, poverty, still smoldering from the devastating fire that had nearly destroyed it in 1871, and even worse, it had never won a World Series. Frankly, the place was a mess. Every day I have the blue. So what do you do? when you want a makeover in the eyes of the world, when you want to show the big boys in London and Paris that you're a major player on the world stage. You throw a party. The 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago was a world's fair that made other world's fairs look like one of those skanky syphilitic fun fairs in Skegness on a Friday night. The city dredged 200 acres of swampland in South Chicago, constructed an entire city out of plaster, built the midway, and introduced the world to carbonated drinks, hamburgers, indoor lighting, bearded lady midgets, the Ferris wheel, rat time music, hoochie coochie shows, and the Pledge of Allegiance. It really shined a light on Chicago and the work ethic of Americans because people were aware of the fire in 1871 and, and you're talking that the city burned to the ground only 20 years prior to this. So the amount of work and the amount of, of work even leading up to even possibly competing to have the fair was huge. But this was kind of proof positive that they had really risen from the ashes and it really shone a light on, on the American worker, uh, the Chicago worker, um, and what people can accomplish if they really put their minds to something and really everybody wanted it from the hourly wage earner to the rich elite people. It was here that Henry Ford saw the internal combustion engine that would give him the idea for a horseless carriage. It inspired L. Frank Baum to write The Wizard of Oz. It was the template for future prefab wonders like Disneyland and Las Vegas. 20 million people visited the Columbian Expo in the six months it ran. Shortly after it closed, it caught fire and melted to the ground like a 600-acre marshmallow. But it changed the way the world viewed America and the way Americans viewed themselves. The designers of the fairs originally wanted this to be greater and grander than any other fair. I mean, when you talk 200 buildings over 600 acres, just placing your eyes on everything it would be over 300 miles of walking and it would take over two weeks. And this was an opportunity for someone who had never probably never left Chicago to actually go and see things from like over 51 different countries that were represented at the fair. What the expo achieved was to create the concept of mass marketing and packaging. 
after the expo, Americans became brand conscious. They didn't want any pancake syrup. They wanted the pancake syrup they'd seen at the expo. The one that emanated from the corpus of a smiling black woman who called herself Aunt Jemima. America had become a consumer economy. The beginning of the 20th century was the singularly most mind-blowing decade of progression in the history of history. What, did you get a new iPhone X in 2018? Good for you. Do you know how much things changed between 1900 and 1910? Well, in 1900, an American might be sitting around trying not to contract diphtheria, waiting for a horse-drawn cart to deliver some unpasteurized milk. A mere 10 years later, conceivably that same person could be driving to an airfield in Dayton, Ohio in a Model T car, listening to a wireless radio broadcast through a plastic headset, wearing clothes freshly laundered in an electric washing machine, and taking pics along the way with a brownie camera, while, in an alternative universe, if you believe this guy's theory, people were doing the same thing except they were moving slower and they would have shrunk somewhat in mass. America had become a consumptive nation. Its trade output was the largest in the world. Stuff, stuff, stuff. The world could not get enough of what America was cranking out. Now, you would think with all this innovation that workers' rights would have progressed. But no. Things were rolling along, but health care? <laughs> Forget it. Paid vacations? Come on. Labor unions had no power whatsoever. From all of you good workers, good news to you, I'll tell. Still, they continued to fight for shorter hours and better working conditions. The phrase uh, that became popular during that period was eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, eight hours for what we will. Right. And the idea of that eight hours for what we will would be to get educated and to be able to finally uh, have the things that uh, the wealthy seem to be able to have. Of course, the wealthy bosses, the Scrooge McDuck swimming in pools of $100 bills, resisted this fiercely. Which side are you on? Most of the captains of American industry have, at one point or another, had their workers shot. Go on, name any rich American industrialist. George Pullman, school dropout, invented the Pullman car. Hooray, everyone can sleep on trains, except for the 30 protesting workers at the Pullman plant in Chicago who were gunned down by federal marshals acting on Pullman's behest. John D. Rockefeller, school dropout, founded Standard Oil. Everyone can heat their homes, except for the 66 striking miners, wives, and children killed by Rockefeller's deputized militia in Ludlow, Colorado. Henry Ford, school dropout. Every American can now afford a car, except for the 64 laid-off employees machine-gunned by security guards at Ford's plant in Dearborn, Michigan. The evil-eyed Thomas Edison, school dropout. Okay, he never had any of his workers shot, but he once electrocuted an elephant just to spite his arch-nemesis, Nikola Tesla. When Edison wasn't shooting current through circus animals, he was illuminating America with his light bulb. But technological advances like this actually had a detrimental effect on the average worker. The great savior of modern progress, indoor lighting, just meant that people worked longer hours. Manufacturers, who by nature are cold-blooded bastards, strive to get even more out of their workers. Something called Taylorism was born. Frederick Taylor was a mechanical engineer from Philadelphia, who, while working at the Bethlehem Steel Corporation in Pennsylvania, became obsessed with time, motion, and human productivity. He invented the term management consultant and then became one. Now, basically, Taylor was that jobs worth twit at work. You know, the one who insists that there's only one right way to do anything, except he took it to lunatic lengths. He watched men loading pig iron and calculated the most efficient way to wield the pig iron shovel so that the maximum amount of pig iron could be lifted in the shortest amount of pig time. He invented something called the auto stereocyclic chronograph and ran around the country delivering his pig iron calculations and micromotion studies. So naturally, Taylor's studies were adopted by factory owners and workers were stripped of the last few remaining ounces of dignity that they owned. Victorian nervousness, the Protestant ethic, craftsmanship, pride, 
Eh, they were gone. In fact, Taylor was so efficient that he accomplished everything he wanted to with his life by the age of 45. So then he retired and spent the remainder of his life staring at his stopwatch waiting to die. The workers of America were once again becoming dehumanized. Reduced to mindless repetition, just like in those old northern factory days. Where had the craftsmanship gone? To live the American dream, you need to be happy in your work. Otherwise, it's not a dream, it's a nightmare. If you're lucky enough to have an occupation where you're making something artistic or creative, you're probably a happy worker. If you're making something out of scarcity, you're probably a happy worker. That's why luthiers are probably a lot happier than people making smartphones. There's an old saying, I hope they make Martins in heaven because I know they make Gibsons in hell. Actually, I just made that up. But if there is a worker's heaven, then it's here in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, home of Martin guitars where every instrument is still crafted by hand. And if you own one, the chances are the person who made it is just as happy about that as you are. A lot of people have been here for a long time. It's, um, there's, there's a lot of pride in what we do, but they, the question specifically about the work ethic, and I think they see that when they come in. Nobody's sweating, but we're working pretty hard and consistently and focusing on quality. There's a tremendous satisfaction in working with your hands, creating something by innate skill, whether you're carving it from scratch out of rosewood or restoring it to its former glory. The best part of this job is making an, is, you know, getting an instrument together for someone to play and, and enjoy playing music with. That's, that's what music's all about, so that's what I get to do. I get to make people happy with getting an instrument for them, you know? And, so you worked in England and you worked in America. Do you see a difference in the, in the work ethic between Brits yeah, and Americans? Yeah, there's, there's a difference. I think uh, the, the Americans, they like, they like to work longer hours. Um, there's several of my colleagues here, they have two or three jobs. And I think that's part of the American dream is to strive for the materialistic things in life. What truly makes work a happy experience? Well, obviously, you know, a, a positive work environment, uh, a balance between work and leisure, being rewarded for your efforts, but there's something else. Making something of quality, something with a soul. Look, I don't want to get all zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance on you here, but when a worker knows that his efforts are going to result in something useful, something lasting, something infused with artistry, well, it, it's a beautiful thing. You only have to look at a 55 T-Bird, the Golden Gate Bridge, an Airstream trailer, for crying out loud. All right, the workers who build them are rational people. You're a rational guy, right? Yeah. And the product itself is romantic. If you get a combination of rational and romantic, you get quality. And that's the secret to worker happiness. Love the thing you do. It's that simple, folks. Nineteen twenties America was a time of dramatic social and political change. For the first time, more Americans lived in cities than on farms. It was roaring. The Jazz Age, Prohibition, Hemingway, Fitzgerald. Why, if you didn't know better, you could swear Americans were starting to get a little culture. An art movement began to gestate, a movement that at its core was anti-industrialist. The arts and crafts movement in the 20s wasn't just an artistic construct. It was a backlash to the barbaric crap America was churning out and the conditions in which that crap was being produced. It advocated economic and social reform by returning to simplicity and traditionalism. This derived more or less from the British social critic John Ruskin, who believed that the moral and social health of a nation was directly related to its art, its architecture, and to the nature of the work itself. This 
is a mission style oak handcrafted rocking chair based on the works of Gustav Stickley, one of the many artisans and craftsmen of the early 20th century who built utopian societies so that they could abide and work in peace in an effort to rekindle the true meaning of the phrase work ethic. This isn't just a rocking chair. Oh no. This is a revolt against conventional life and its insensibility to beauty against cheap industrial progress and the even cheaper cheapness of the lives that were lost for that progress. It was made well and sold cheap. Today, a genuine stickly chair can go for upwards of five figures, and many of them, many of them, are owned by Barbara Streisand. Oh, I got plenty of nothing. Ultimately, the arts and crafts ethos would inform the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, a name that inspires reverential gasps whenever a highbrow discussion of American architecture takes place. Frank used a unique vocabulary of form and space and pattern, which, when he wasn't banging the wives of his clients, changed the notion of what architecture should be to most Americans. He used open spaces and horizontal lines and a free-flowing sense of proportion, all the while maintaining a heady arrogance and usurping the talents of the underlings who worked for him and banging the wives of his clients. Among his most notable creations are his house here in Oak Park, Chicago, Falling Water in Pennsylvania, the Usonian Homes of New York, the Guggenheim Museum in Manhattan, Taliesin in Wisconsin, where a disgruntled cook named Julian Carlton buried an axe in his mistress's head while Wright was away in Chicago on a so-called business trip. The cook then set fire to Wright's home and burned it to the ground, killing six more people. Many of these rooms are open to the public now and allow visitors to wander around and gaze in amazement at Frank Lloyd Wright's handiwork, somehow conveniently overlooking the fact that a man put a fucking axe into the head of the woman Frank loved and he had to bury her in a casket that he'd made with his own hands. Just about the most gut-wrenching, heartbreaking thing you can imagine, but hey, come on, look at this filigree. Oh. What's the message here, folks? Life is a mixture of achievement and tragedy. If you've achieved something with your life, that's how the world remembers you. If you haven't, you're just some poor Schmendrick whose mistress got killed by an axe murderer. What are we living for? Two rooms, apartment on the second floor. No money coming in. In terms of social reform, the arts and craft movement was just a blip on the radar. Pretty much killed off by the arrival of the Great Depression. It's pretty hard to take pride in your work when there isn't any. At the start of the 1930s, more than a quarter of America's wage earners were on the skids. For most of that decade, America was in the throes of depression, and amidst this upheaval, writers and artists used their work to document the working man's struggles, to try to dignify it. John Steinbeck's novel of Mice and Men told the story of George and Lenny, two fellas trying desperately to get a slice of the American dream, and guess what? It doesn't end well. The struggle for the American dream was a compelling narrative, not only in much of America's literature, but in its art as well. Grant Wood's American Gothic is arguably the most recognizable painting in America, and its meaning has always been open to speculation. What's going on here? What's the relationship between this uh, apparently humorless looking couple who look like their faces are being dragged into the fertile Iowa soil right underneath their feet? What's with the pitchfork? and the frivolously ornate window in an otherwise claptrap house. It's a real chin scratcher, folks. But what the hell does it all mean? To me, these were the quintessential Americans. This was the American couple, a little kind of worn out, but hardworking, really uh, durable, resilient people. And for a long time, that was my image of what the American people looked like. This is like the, the stalwart, um, and pretty grim, or at least, hum you know, not very humorous um, 
people that were the backbone of the country. I think that's maybe what it meant. If you look at the painting, it's almost as if you can see two different images at the same time. One is of this hardworking, simple, rugged Midwest couple, and at the other time you see this dour, maybe doubtful, adrift, lonely couple who don't seem particularly happy with a lot that life has given them. I think it, um, it represents a kind of joyless austerity uh, in work. We don't quite know what to make of these people. We don't know what to make of their age differences. We don't know whether they are being ridiculed or celebrated. Uh, we don't know if they're from the 1930s or the 1890s. This is not an easy painting. It's very dour. It's very severe. And yet it does suggest one's complex relationship to work. The painting isn't called American Gothic because of the emotionally vacant couple. It's called American Gothic because of the house behind them, which you could buy in a catalog at the time. And the house's defining feature is the ornate window. That's what drew Grant Wood to it. In this sense, Gothic doesn't mean Teutonic or Edgar Allan Poe or The Cure. It just means ornate. To a lot of Americans, American Gothic represents the stigma of landlessness, the sword of poverty always hanging right over our heads. Because in America, if you don't work, you starve. Literally, figuratively, spiritually. When American strangers meet, first thing they ask each other is, what do you do? You know, not what do you think, what do you feel, what do you do? An American's character is defined by his labors, which is why this posing couple looks like they can't wait for Grant Wood to finish his portrait so they can get back to pitchforking. Wood was a regionalist painter, trying to capture the essence of the Midwest in his portraits. He put remarkable detail into the human characters he painted. But his landscapes are cartoonish. Grant Wood's version of Midwestern America is fat, bulbous, impossibly pregnant with greenery. Why a weed would be blasphemy. But Wood wasn't being naive, he was being satirical. In the real world, Wood's bountiful Midwest was blowing away. The Dust Bowl had devastated the land. Those hardworking farmers of the Midwest had actually overworked the soil. And the promise of endless abundance that America was built on had become a joke. When we think about the, the real landscape of farming in the Midwest in the 1930s, you have drought, dust pole, farm strikes, labor unrest. None of this comes into the sunny landscapes of Grant Wood. Uh, he is as far removed as you could imagine from the kind of turmoil of farming in the 1930s. And the reason for that is that for him, farmscapes have very little to do with the reality of farming. Uh, they are homages to the farms in an idealized sense of his childhood. Grant claimed to be the plainest kind of fella you can find. There isn't a single thing I've done or experienced, he said, that's been even the least bit exciting. He was a modest, homespun-looking guy who you'd pass on any small town street and barely notice. But that was deceiving, because in fact, Wood was a classically trained artist who'd studied extensively in Europe and could faithfully imitate the masters like Van Gogh or Monet. By 1930, the year that he painted American Gothic, Grant Wood had clearly come into his own distinctive style, and it divided people. Serious art critics, they didn't like it. They thought it was too naive and non-dimensional. You know, all those, those boob-shaped trees and hills, kind of stuff you would find in a gift shop, and, and way too feminine. <laughs> Conversely, the human figures in his paintings are all masculine. Even the women look like men. If his hardworking beefcake manly man figures remind you of anything, it might be this. Romantic nationalism. The idea that the superiority of a nation is tied to its terrain. The 
connection between Wood's work and a kind of fascist aesthetic is not uh, a new idea. Uh, Wood's nemesis at the University of Iowa, Horst Janssen, uh, tried to discredit Wood in the years after Wood's death in 1942. Janssen was a diehard modernist. He loathed Wood's work. And he wrote a very influential article in the mid-1940s comparing Wood's work to the aesthetic of the Third Reich. It was absolutely damning. It was terrible for his reputation, wholly off the mark, but was very much a part of mid-1940s criticism after Wood's death, conveniently when he could no longer defend himself. You country corn flakes, you country corn flakes, from fields of corn, so majestically waving. No American painting has been more parodied than American Gothic. Anytime you want to reduce someone to simple one-dimensional yokels, pose them with a pair of overalls and a pitchfork. You country corn flakes, they're made from corn. All right, we get it. It's visual shorthand for people too uptight to relax. But relaxation was always going to be the antidote to the chronic overwork that drives America. Give people something to do. Placate them. The greatest work incentive America ever came up with was escaping the crap you put up with each day and going into a dark room, staring at a blank canvas that projected dreams onto it. In the year 1925, 50 million people a week went to the movies, the equivalent of half the nation's population. In Chicago, in 1929, theaters had enough seats for half the city's population to attend a movie each day. American cinema goers were now being fed the American dream by Hollywood. Not only were they looking at themselves, they were looking at people who had reinvented themselves. And for a few hours, everyone could escape reality before remembering that the next day they'd have to go back to the production line loading that pig iron. The emergence of modernism in America finally allowed filmmakers and writers and artists to question the American dream. In fact, any time a literary or artistic endeavor is designated the great American so-and-so, it's actually about how great America isn't. Take the great American novel, Great Gatsby. What's it about? Self-made millionaire trying to use his ill-gotten gains to buy his way into Long Island society, but he can't have the one thing he wants, Daisy Buchanan. Played by Mia Farrow in the 1974 film version of the book, who convincingly portrayed the character's shallow quality. Why didn't you wait for me? Because rich girls don't marry poor boys, Jay Gatsby. The great American play, Death of a Salesman. The American dream has left Willie Loman behind, but he can't let it go. And he tries heartbreakingly to instill it into his kid, Biff. <laughs> Why is he crying? Dad, will you let me go for God's sake? Will you take that phony dream and burn it before something happens? The great American movie. The Godfather, a violent criminal, actually believes his family and his business can be accepted into mainstream American society on his own insanely misguided terms. I work my own life. I don't apologize to take care of my family. And I refuse to be a fool. Dancing on the string held by all those big shots. The message is always the same. Okay, hard work may make you money, but it can't buy you love, or status, or redemption. When Americans get above their status, they become victims of tragedy. In a way, we are all not so great Gatsby's. By the time the 50s rolled around, the nightmare of the previous decades had comfortably reverted to a dream. Americans could pursue it with unbridled optimism, and boy, did they ever. They brought everything they could get their hands on. It was all new and shiny, and a reminder that they defeated fascism. Yes, I'm so glad I'm living in the USA. The idea that the 50s was the golden age of happiness in America is one of the great lies of our history. Yeah, it was a great decade if you were white and middle class. Oh, how I yearn for you. There was peace and prosperity. Elvis, big Finn Oldsmobiles. 
But the 50s was really a decade of physical and spiritual restlessness. Big city northerners pulled up stakes and headed south and west. California's population grew by 49%, Florida's by 79%. By 1960, a third of America had traded in the urban grind for a driveway and a sad tree. Anything you want, they got it right here in the USA. Uh, uh, Uncle Ike Eisenhower, America's non-politician president, worried that Americans were becoming deadened in mind and soul by a materialistic philosophy of life. So in 1957, he passed a bill to put In God We Trust on American money, just to remind Americans that every impulsive purchase was a slap in God's face. There's something wrong with human nature. What is it in the nature of men that causes men to lie and hate and cheat and steal? God started showing up on TV as well. His earthly vessel was a lantern-jawed Calvinist preacher from North Carolina named Billy Graham. Graham's televised crusades, yep, that's what he called them, were the equivalent of a rock concert, culminating in a discharge of salvation seekers streaming toward his pulpit for repentance. Graham became America's first religious superstar. His message wasn't much different from those Massachusetts Puritans. Only God can judge. But a more self-centered piety was also forming, one that better served the working stiff of the 50s. This preacher promoted the gospel of self-esteem, and his God was less an avenging angel and more like a motivational speaker. In 1952, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale published a self-help book called The Power of Positive Thinking. It was, in essence, a dream manual, supplanting the physical work ethic with self-realization. Peel preached that what the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Through a combination of faith and self-confidence, any obstacle could be surmounted. So the only logical conclusion for his followers was that if they did exactly what this man said, they could end up just like him, a man whose picture was on the cover of his own book. And as they filed out of the auditorium after his sermons, they got a double dose of inspiration by seeing that this man wasn't so high and mighty that he wouldn't be seen standing in the lobby amid stacks of the very same book he'd just been talking about. Boom, boom, boom. For three consecutive years, between 1953 and 1956, only the Bible outsold the power of positive thinking. Church attendance rose by 20% in the 50s. The rich didn't get much richer, the poor didn't get much poorer, but the middle class, boom, mushroom. In 50 short years, America had gone from a subsistence economy to a consumer economy to an acquisition economy. In 1950, there were 10 million television sets. By 1960, 47 million. Many of them tuned in to see Ozzy and Harriet, a sitcom about a conformist white suburban family mirroring the white suburban conformist families watching them. Look, if you two are going to loaf, you go in the other room and do it, because i got work to do here. You know, Thorny, I have a hunch we're not wanted around here. You know, I think you're right. You don't have to knock me over the knuckles with a wooden spoon. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> wooden spoon. Where's my knee? The major networks created shows like Ozzy and Harriet, Leave it to Beaver, and The Donna Reed Show to mollify viewers. These characters didn't talk about the Marshall Plan or Palestine. Blacks and Mexicans didn't inhabit this world. It was an antiseptic vision of middle-class America where everything smelled minty fresh. When any president, from Reagan to Bush to Trump, trots out that make America great again bromide, this is the era they are invoking. If the American dream is a promise of upward mobility for one brief period in our history, it worked. Assuming your idea of the American dream is cultural malnutrition, patio furniture, and a sad tree, what was so great about the 50s? Well, the middle class mushroom. The economy was robust. The opening salvos to the civil rights movement were fired. The interstate was built. People were going places. So naturally, something had to be invented to tap into America's insecurity about its abundance. The Red Scare. I don't think you have any conception of the danger of the Communist Party. The 
communist witch hunt of the 50s, orchestrated by the firebrand nutcase Joseph McCarthy, tapped into the heart of America's insecurity about its newfound wealth. A conformist brainwashed nation was under threat of being turned into a conformist brainwashed nation. If uh, fighting communists and getting a bit rough with them, uh, Mr. Hilly, is un-American, then I must plead guilty to being un-American. The target of McCarthy and his right-wing zealots was the working left. The people who made their living as academics, politicians, screenwriters, and artists. And the best thing you can do to an artist is to tell him he can't be an artist. The mass conformity of the 50s and the hysterical attempts to protect it led to rock and roll, abstract expressionism, beatniks, the books of Hugh Selby, Henry Miller, and that begat hippies, counterculturalism, the SDS, the Black Panthers, LSD, Charles Manson, alternative medicine, continental philosophy, social media addiction, and ultimately the dystopia that we live in today. Although McCarthy was doing his best to whip up his anti-communist hysteria, most Americans were just happy to live the dream, ensconced in a customized bungalow somewhere in Rolling Meadows Estates with a big old fancy set of wheels parked outside. In a prefab world, craftsmanship will always find a way to seep through. You know, in the 1930s, it was a, it was a fancy schmancy window in a claptrap house. In 1956, it was a Lincoln premier. Look at this, chrome, tail fins, white walls, tucked and rolled interior, plenty of headroom. Seats 12 for dinner, six miles to a gallon. Detroit was the manufacturing envy of the world. You are about to witness the very exciting story of a city and its people. It will be an adventure that will open new sights in familiar surroundings. There was a time when America was bold and optimistic about its future, and Detroit responded with big cylinder monsters, dripping with chrome and luxury. This was, of course, the direct result of Henry Ford who, when he wasn't gunning down his employees, had figured out how to get them to build a new car every two and a half hours. America was on the move, and Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors sold millions. Suffice it to say, Detroit was the industrial showpiece of the world, a place where people could come to find opportunity, the epitome of the American dream. Then it all went down the dumper. How could the legacy of Henry Ford, an industrialist so worldly admired that Hitler himself had given him a shout out in Mein Kampf, turn into this? Nobody buying cars no more. For the simple fact that, you know, the economy, the gas situation, and it's, it's a major crisis. You know, a lot of people are already laid off, and uh, if any more getting people laid off, boy, it's going to be. It's going to be a crisis out there, boy. If they think the economy is bad now, what is it going to be like when all them people are all laid off there? What are they going to do? It seems like the crime in that would obviously go up, you know. It would darn near make a Christian turn bad. Detroit went bust because it made a product that many, many Americans did not want. And then once they lost that brand loyalty, they could not figure out for many years how, how to recover it. And what was uh, one of the great unionized, well-paid, secure industrial workforces in the entire world suddenly found itself with shrinking prospects and ultimately most of them out of the job. Not just on the auto assembly lines, but companies that made parts to, to sell to GM, to sell to Ford, to sell to Chrysler. Okay, all those people out of business. All those workers displaced, and Detroit as a city collapsed in on itself and depopulated. And portions of it are coming back now, but it's never going to be a great American city again. It's a great tragedy. It's a great tragedy uh, brought about not by the failure of the workers, but by the failures of the managerial class. Let me tell you a little story. When I was growing up in the South, 
There was a fellow in our town who used to just stand in the middle of the road and just yell, Mustang shitbox. That's all he would say. Mustang shitbox. Mustang shitbox. Bit of a fixture. So naturally, we called him Mustang shitbox. And the story was is that he'd gone to Detroit to work on Mustangs because he loved Mustangs, just lived and breathed Mustangs. By the time he got the job, the production values on the Mustang were so poor that basically it was just a joke on wheels. The soul of the machine was destroyed, and it destroyed his soul. And he came home just a, just a broken man. So what had happened? Well, Ford had fallen on bad times, right? Horrible design, bad management, Japanese competition, and worst of all, the city of Detroit had turned its back on Ford. Wouldn't help him out. Ford built Detroit, but when it needed Detroit's help, Detroit shafted it. So what are you saying, Rich? Detroit ruined a human being? No, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, truth is, Mustang shitbox, that guy, that dude was messed up long before he went to Detroit. Whoa! <laughs> Our town should have never let him go in the first place. That's my point. Communities are supposed to take care of their people. And that big old building was a textile mill. It fed our kids and it paid our bills. But they turned us out and they closed the doors. We can't make it here anymore. For the people of small town America, security comes from being part of a company and part of the community. So what do you do when the wheels fall off? Rusted tracks empty storefronts around the square there's a needle in the gutter and glass everywhere you don't come down here unless you're looking to score we can't make it here anymore this is lancaster ohio in 1947 this town was featured on the cover of forbes magazine as the quintessential american town it's the home of the anchor hawking glass company the largest manufacturer of table glassware in the world. Everybody loved Anchor Hawking. If you gave your mom Anchor Hawking glasses at Christmas, you were good for the year. And then something horrible happened. The company got sold to a bigger company, they sold it to another company, they sold it to another company, and every one of them just squeezed the profits right off the top. They pilfered, they purloined, they plundered it. People would come to work and not even know who owned the company that day. This is the kind of town that even Springsteen wouldn't write a song about. It's that grim. We have a higher poverty rate than we once had. Um, my wife is a teacher in the school system, and we have 50% or so poverty rate people that receive free lunches, that type of thing, which is, did not used to be the case. This used to be a very upper middle class town. There's not as many jobs. There's more families struggling. There's, there's not any help for anybody. And if you need help for things, you don't meet those requirements. They, it's like they make it impossible around here to live. And now it's a winter. Winter in America. In these economically depressed regions of the American Midwest and Great Lakes region, Lancaster, Youngstown, Detroit, these famous examples, there seems to be a real crisis of confidence. People feel trapped in these communities. They don't have the resources to leave, but at the same time, staying provides no standard of living. And it is emblematic of this potential transformation, this post-industrial transformation in the work ethic where a hard day's work doesn't provide a decent wage, doesn't provide a living wage. 78% of the people in this town voted for Trump. Not because they wanted to, because they're desperate. And so they pin their hopes on a New York City millionaire with a bad comb over, who's never set foot in Ohio, unless of course that foot was covered in a golf shoe. I want to make our military so strong, so powerful, so great, that nobody's going to mess with us. And when Trump got elected, a lot of people worried he was going to start a war. I don't think they foresaw he was going to restart the Civil War. The only problem with the new old civil war is it's based on our revised ideas of morality. What does that mean? Okay, let me ask you this. Why has it taken 160 years for all those Confederate statues to be demolished? Because up until a few years ago, most white people didn't actually think they were that racist. This nation today, uh, regardless of social class, is more deeply divided than it has been at any time since the Civil War you have to take into account that the Republican Party has essentially become the National White People's Party. 
And large n numbers of, of middle-class Americans are not white. Interestingly, it's the regions where we have the highest levels of immigrant populations are booming economically, are the most diverse, and are the most prosperous. Diversity and prosperity seem to go hand in hand. So if I'm watching Fox News and I hear how immigrants are ruining the country, I'm gonna probably be much more likely to believe that if there are not immigrants who I've actually met and live in the community and I see what they're contributing, it's easier to stereotype and dehumanize that which you've never met before. You load 16 tons, and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Americans like to brag that they don't have a class system like Britain, you know, all that Delton Abbey stuff. They like to think that travel and distance and migration turn them into a homogenized society with a shared work ethic. That's total bullshit. America has a class system, it's very simple. When you go to work, if your name is on the outside of the building you work in, you're rich. If your name is on your desk, you're middle class. If your name is on your shirt, you're fucking poor. It's like I said earlier, when Americans raise above their status, they're victims of tragedy. When they can't raise above their status, they're victims of comedy. A lot of the sitcoms in the early days of television cast poor workers in white trash as objects of disparagement, struggling to maintain some semblance of pride. The Honeymooners. When you saw the opening titles to The Honeymooners, you knew it was a show where Jackie Gleason, playing a Brooklyn bus driver, and Art Carney, a sewer worker, were trying to reach for the moon. They would constantly invent get-rich-quick schemes that ultimately backfired. And it was hilarious watching two men repeatedly fail at the American dream while wrecking their own homes. Come and listen to my story about a man named Jay. Jed Clampett and his hillbilly family trying to reconcile their Depression-era roots with the millionaire denizens of Southern California, loping around, spouting corn-fed homilies out of lopsided mouths. Americans lapped it up, subconsciously understanding that poor people in America may never escape their plight, but can at least win an occasional moral victory, especially when it meant that the rich folks ended up looking more like the hillbillies. Her and me is going out hunting. Is that right, Miss Hathaway? Well, yes, and... Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jethro, you can take that pink chicken back out to the cement pond. We're going out and shoot us a nice, big, fluffy souffle. Uh, Gomer Pyle? Yes. All in the family? All in the uh, family. The Jefferson. Oh, All of the, the Jeffersons. Jeffersons. Yes. Good times, good times. Yes. Good times. Jimmy Walker. J.J. That, Walker. That, that J.J. was dynamite. Oh, man. Television never seemed to reward the American worker with any upward mobility, despite all their best efforts, you know? These people could not escape their situation. You know what I mean, Erica? Yes. Because if they could escape their situation, it wouldn't be a situation comedy, right? No. That class system Americans refused to recognize? Yeah, well, it was all over the television. Eventually, the TV working class family started moving upwards middle-class urban characters living in brick-walled lofts. Nowadays, the middle class may be slathered all over television, but obviously that's not a real reflection because America's middle class is shrinking. It's patently obvious that America's middle class is slipping down the economic ladder. It's a big job, it's getting by. How do you know the middle class is shrinking? Well, when politicians start using it as a political football. I know why we're strong. I know why we have held together. I know why we are united. It's because there's always been a growing middle class. This guy doesn't have a clue about the middle class. Not a clue. Does anyone have a clue about the middle class? Of course not. What does the term even mean? Well, interestingly enough, the middle class was invented by Benjamin Franklin. He believed that Western migration would create class stability, that the sheer size of America would reduce class conflict, and that every American was entitled to a happy mediocrity. And that's what the middle class is, the happy mediocrity. 
the white collar workers, the middle managers, the guy or gal walking into some fluorescent hell hole every day, sitting down at a gunmetal gray desk piled up with paperwork, and on the wall is a poster of some skydivers holding hands, and underneath it says, teamwork. 90% of Americans claim they're middle class. In other words, marginally comfortable. And it's those people who are seeing those margins tighten every day. Why is it so hard to make it in America? In the 70s and 80s, um, the middle class life in America became quite bumpy. Under Nixon, you had price controls, you had serious intervention in the economy. Post Nixon, you have the Carter administration where something that, that was was terrifying to the middle class occurred, which was stagflation. Productivity stopped growing, output stopped growing. So people's incomes weren't increasing anymore, but their expenses were, were through the roof. America was heading into its worst economic crisis since the 30s, and things weren't about to get any breezier. Fortunately, a hero was waiting in the wings. Action, go. And once he got his pants on, he'd come riding into Dodge City to clean the town up. Oh, shh. I'm speaking to you tonight to give you a report on the state of our nation's economy. I regret to say, that we're in the worst economic mess since the Great Depression. He promised salvation. He was going to reduce government spending, taxes, and regulations. Sound familiar? Up until the 1980s, most working people here in America who were middle class received a defined benefit pension. Major companies were allowed to walk away from that commitment to the social fabric so that one after another defined benefit pension plans vanished. That's a very significant event because now people are insecure in their jobs and they're insecure in their uh, prospects for uh, a reasonably comfortable old age. She got a The middle class were the people who did everything right. They got a college degree, they developed a marketable skill, they built up a resume, they got married, they cranked out a couple of kids, they bought a Chevy. Modest, responsible people just trying to get their slice of the American pie. And now they're scrambling around job fairs or combing the classifieds, going onto job websites, listening to some self-styled fatuous guru tell them how to get back the job they already had. Now I have a theory, and it's just a theory. Craftsmen have to work with their hands. Artists work with their hearts. Rich people work with their brains. Poor people work with their backs. But the middle class has to work with their personalities. And if you've ever met Americans, a good number of them can barely negotiate the rope barriers at an airport check-in. For years I've been busting my rear. Yet, they're expected to figure out their place in the corporate beehive, who to boss around, who to be subservient to, who's asked to kiss, who's asked to kick, how to handle the psychological demands, the mind games, and the poorly defined expectations dumped on them by corporate management, and all the while, try to appear like they know what they're doing. Corporate employees never say they're looking for a hard worker, you know, someone who will give you a straightforward exchange of wages for effort. Nope, they need you to be outgoing, friendly, resourceful, qualified, dedicated, and passionate. A working man can't get no today. Let's face it, if you can fake all those emotions, what the hell are you doing working at Yo-Yo Tech? You should be in Hollywood, accepting an Oscar for Best Actor. Yeah, the middle class is struggling. You can blame it on the crash of 2008 or stagnant wage growth or downsizing or outsourcing. But that doesn't answer the simple, basic question, why did you get shit canned and not the other guy? Because the other guy had better people skills than you. You weren't dynamic enough. You didn't read enough motivational material. 
How can you take the abuse you get on a sit? What you need is a rousing, motivational tirade. Kind of like Alec Baldwin in Glengarry Glen Ross. I can go out there tonight. The materials you got make myself $15,000. Tonight, in two hours, can you? Can you? Go and do likewise. A-I-D-A. -A. Get mad, you son of a bitches. Get mad. You know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass balls to sell real estate. America doesn't have brass balls anymore. We left them on the moon. That was our last team success. Nowadays, success is measured through personal growth. Yeah, you can walk to any bookstore and pass that one section, try not to be reminded why you personally are a big loser. Generally, these will follow two different approaches. There is the numerical approach to success, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people, the five second rule, the 40 pillars of pyramidal success, or it's some sort of anthropomorphic, vaguely childlike approach. Barking up the wrong tree. Who moved my cheese? Eat that frog. The uterus is a feature, not a bug. I don't even know where to begin not knowing what that means. Working in a coal mine, going down, down, down. Working in a coal the straightforward approach to self-improvement by men like Norman Vincent Peale has given way to a litany of bona fide gibberish by clowns such as Seth Godin, author and corporate guru, who somehow manages to string words, images, and balloons into some sort of narrative event. Getting started with this is really hard, but if you do the physics, after the first two breaths, the percentage change in latex that you're making gets smaller and smaller and smaller with each breath. And that the model is, if you can get the first two breaths over with, you're gonna get the balloon filled up because it's downhill from there. At the beginning, there's lots and lots and lots of argument and discussion with the lizard brain. As if the only thing holding you back is that crazy lizard running around inside your brain. You know, that's, that's, that's good advice for Jim Morrison. That is useless for the corporate world. The corporate world doesn't want you to be successful or dynamic. The corporate world doesn't even know your name. That's why they gave you a laminate. In the year 35, 35, ain't gonna need to tell the truth, tell no lies. America has become a country where you can create your own fantasy of what it means to be an American. You don't even have to bother working anymore. The self-made man has become the self-made up man online where you really can invent yourself quite literally. You can be just exactly whoever you want to be online. You can be any age, race, gender, class, education level. You can completely fabricate yourself. Now that may not be in the spirit of the hard work to earn the American dream, but it's still very much in line with this recreation of identity. Nobody can prove the truth because nobody knows what the truth is. <laughs> and if you can't prove the truth, just prove the other person is lying. That's the world we live in. <laughs> An entire generation of selfie stick wielding narcissistic fuckwits who believe that every opinion is valid, every belief is relative, and you can define yourself by something other than what you do. I believe we can keep the promise of our founding. The idea that if you're willing to work hard, it doesn't matter who you are, or where you come from, or what you look like, or where you love. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white, or Hispanic, or Asian, or Native American, or young, or old, or rich, or poor, able, disabled, gay, or straight. You can make it here in America if you're willing to try. U.S. of A. sells itself as the land where you can rise from rags to riches. Opportunity is the main component of that ethos. In 1931, the author and social critic James Truslow Adams coined a phrase for it, the American dream. Back then, it had more to do with idealism than materialism. Too many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption, human identity, 
is no longer defined by what one does, but by what one owns. The greatest misconception of the American dream, and this has been documented in years of polling, that it really doesn't mean wealth. In fact, um, wealth usually comes in toward the bottom of what people associate with the American dream. Toward the very top, the things people most associate the dream with are family, community, freedom. Wealth plays a role, but not a predominant role, and it's not central. When Americans are free to pursue their dreams, there is no limit to what we can achieve. This is truly an exciting time in our country. Every day, we're accomplishing great things for our people. We're really moving along. We're bringing back our jobs. We're making America great again. Thank you. One of the interesting similarities between Trump and Obama is their adherence to the dream. Barack Obama, the subtitle of his book, The Audacity of Hope, is reclaiming the American dream, that there was something good that we've lost or neglected. Donald Trump, what prefaced, let's make America great again, was a phrase along the lines of, sadly, the American dream is dead, but if I get elected, I'm gonna bring it back bigger and better than before. We will make America wealthy again. Having said that, it seems for the first time in generations as if Americans view um, their, the notion that they'll be more successful than their parents as not guaranteed. 70% of Americans hate their jobs, many of them to the Nicholson-esque extreme and the shining. So why do we do it? Because it feels good when we stop. That's why, despite all the rhetoric, America is actually only the 17th hardest working country on the planet. They're 11th in gender pay disparity. They're number two in workplace injuries and number one in unpaid workers' holidays. But that doesn't bother Americans because we inherently believe we shouldn't be paid to sit on the beach rubbing suntan lotion into our fat necks. A holiday is an experience, and Americans prefer things to experiences. Things like a big plasma screen TV and patio furniture. God bless them. The Protestant work ethic is never going to go away. It's part of our metaphoric identity. But, despite what old Donnie T says, what made America great was the Protestants, the Germans, the Irish, the Muslims, the African Americans, the Asians, and the Mexicans who came here. Just like those Puritans, in the haphazard chance they might find redemption and dignity in their work. And barring that, a big old plasma screen TV and patio furniture will do very nicely. Maybe this can all best be summed up in the philosophical ramblings of that astute Canadian band, Loverboy. So I'll let them speak for themselves. <laughs>